So, Mr. President, uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us today. First question uh, I would like to ask you is uh, the following one. The Red Cross is, uh, has a continuity of, uh, with Sofirino, for example, but like everything else, it is changing. So what it is that is changing, especially under your presidency? It's not so much changes under my presidency. It is the world around us which is changing and which is uh, forcing us, uh, compelling us to adapt and change certain of our practices because uh, with, uh, they have proved with time uh, that they need to adapt to uh, modern times. You know that the, the, our agency is the innovation of, from the 19th century. It was a problem for the uh, uh, human rights. Uh, for the, it's also uh, how to implement these human rights issues on the ground. It's also, we also have uh, advocacy with the governments, especially for policy making. Uh, and I think this humanitarian action, which was founded in the 19th century, uh, which was a new domain, and it's still relevant. We have developed some things which uh, remain. We want to be working on conflict zones. We want to be close to conflict zone. We want to be uh, assisting on the front. Uh, we want to assist uh, civilians. Uh, we want to uh, mitigate the impacts of violence, but also change behaviors of the belligerents. We want to make sure that uh, international humanitarian rights are being complied with. So these are our ambitions. These are uh, practices, uh, modes of actions, which uh, are uh, inform and guide our uh, action. S what changes, however, is that the, co the environment of the conflicts that we are faced with today uh, as in terms of indication, over the first years, the budget of the CSIR has almost doubled. So there's something that something is going wrong in the world. So what is going wrong? Uh, in fact, we are a world now where we have uh, belligerents which are no longer states, but uh, we have a mix of states and more and more fragmented actors. We see that military strategies are more and more uh, uh, do not comply with uh, international law as we know it. Uh, so there, there's more and more impact, uh, negative impacts on the civilians. If you see wars such as the one in the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen, for example, you see that uh, there is a great impact on the civilians, uh, which is uh, extremely important. We have uh, uh, displacements of populations. There's a degradation of the uh, social systems. We have never had as many attacks on hospitals and on humanitarian workers, on doctors, as we've had over the past uh, 10 years. So we see there are much more important impacts. We have discussed uh, a while ago, we're talking about investments in Africa. We have been talking about investments in other regions. How can you invest in regions where you know uh, there is a world that is more and more fragile, more and more fragmented, a world where violence has a greater and greater impact? So, of course, uh, well, this is why we have to adapt our means and our activities and to find also ways and means of uh, making, uh, bringing changes about behavior. We have to use diplomatic influence. Uh, we need to have a diplomacy that is more and more active. And sometimes we have also to forget about our uh, legendary discretion where we try to uh, work uh, in uh, complying with the confidentiality and conviction. Now we more and more have to speak out. We cannot be silenced when you're confronted with uh, so many violations of human rights. So we are trying to find, uh, maintain what makes us a specific a, uh, or body and also adapt to the, we, we also had in a movement that is trying to to see in a very positive way, the, uh, to follow very positively the evolution, technological evolution. I spent a few weeks on the west coast of the states talking about uh, digital digitalization. You've probably seen Brad Smith from Microsoft. He's published his uh, digital Geneva Convention. Um, we not only have to think about the violence of conflicts that we have now and how we can adapt our methodology to these conflicts, 
but we also look at the board the coming uh, digital borders uh, that will be connected differently will uh, Will uh, also there will be connection with the actors of violence, and we will be confronted with probably a war that is constantly moving in in the virtual space. So thank you very much. I remember when we met for the first time in your office in Geneva. You told me that the institution that uh, has the best knowledge and by far of the conflict in Syria was the Red Cross. Uh, could you probably comment on this uh, particular example that you gave? Uh, because this is uh, something this is uh, very extremely relevant today. And probably in a more subsidiary way, uh, uh, the Red Cross, in order to accomplish its mission, and, uh, has to have access to the key uh, key uh, actors, uh, probably sometimes dictators, and, what, and uh, you need to build trust with them uh, so that uh, they and ensure them, uh, reassure them that what they're saying will never be disseminated, So, which is from the diplomatic point of view something that is rather complex. So here within, uh, we're in the continuity of the Red Cross, it was true in the past, it was will be true in the future, so probably we want to make a few comments. So there are two questions. You're asking me two questions. The one on uh, our uh, specificity, we remain an organization or a, we are a uh, Swiss uh, ONG with a mandate from the all international community, all the states that have signed the Geneva Conventions. There are not so many uh, bodies like ours who are not governed by the states, so it gives us an additional credibility in comparison with other actors. Uh, with respect to our neutrality, uh, our traditional neutrality. So this neutrality is, uh, and, and partiality is very important in the work that we're doing, especially that we're working in a gradual, a fragmented world, as I have described it. We're trying to enter in contact with the, the weapon uh, owners and holders uh, to uh, try to uh, engage them to uh, comply with the norms. So what is at stake is not uh, so much our legitimacy to do so. I think the Geneva Conventions in their Article 3 uh, says very clearly that the uh, Red Cross is uh, there to commit with uh, conflict actors, whether they be uh, state actors or non-state actors. So this gives us a certain legitimacy to work with uh, uh, humanitarian issues on the respect of law and the on the assistance and protection of the civilian populations, even in areas that are under the control of non-armed groups. The big problem now is to have those groups talk to us now. The, we need to have a commitment and uh, to the respect of international law. And so we are here confronted with uh, complex issues. We need to use all sorts of means. Uh, to uh, work with people who have influence, uh, who have uh, can establish contacts for us, who can open the paths for us. But I think we still uh, keep this, stick to this ambition of having a humanitarian agenda. Uh, uh, we need to, to talk to all the parties does not uh, give legitimacy to all the actors. Uh, we also need to take reality into consideration. We know that many of those actors now are more and more fragmented, and they don't necessarily to enter into a dialogue with uh, a body that is here to uh, make the uh, to look into the respect of uh, human law. And uh, so this is, as you have alluded to this, you talked about alluded to confidentiality. We're trying to strike a balance uh, in certain delicate matters. When do we talk? Uh, when do we uh, when do, uh, remain uh, uh, bound by confidentiality? So we try as much as possible to create an environment where we can influence and we can help bring about uh, changes in behavior. It's not so much the level of violence. It's the the non uh, the lack of will to change and sometimes we are compelled to say enough is enough we also need to express the fact that there are uh, sometimes uh, very serious violations of human rights 
Our patients, of course, uh, especially working with uh, institutions, political bodies, uh, goes much further and much more in depth uh, than uh, this is what allows us, uh, together with our colleagues from the uh, National Societies of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, to have specific alliances and uh, uh, specific uh, actors on the ground which enable us to be there on the ground. This is why you always find the, uh, our representatives in uh, rural areas of Afghanistan, for example, where you see uh, f very few other actors who go into those remote areas. If you go to South Somalia, for example, uh, in regions uh, under the control of al-Shabaab. You will find us also. We find us in the Syrian regions where other actors uh, do not have the legitimacy to step in. You will find us in North Mali. You will find us in North Nigeria, in the, in the uh, Chad Lake area. We do uh, bring uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, this is not to confer legitimacy on anyone, but also to just to uh, show that we are impartial, independent, and so we help to uh, mitigate the impact of violence on the populations, but also to shrink the needs, of, that is, change behaviors of the actors on the ground. I can understand uh, and I do understand all this, and I think many of the people here in this room understand this very well. But we live in a world where there is the ideology of transparency. That is, the ethical concepts that uh, dominant ethical concepts now are no longer the same that uh, uh, you had, for example, uh, back in the, in the war, in the Second World War. So maybe you're sometimes uh, this puts you sometimes in difficult situations. Uh, today, the, the world that we hear everywhere is transparency. That's what we hear everywhere. We uh, we want to have access to all uh, information, and uh, we think there should be no secrets, whatever. So uh, this is something that is uh, conflictual with the, the concept of confidentiality. Thierry, I think that if there is one area that uh, where you have a lot of uh, dilem dilemmas, it is the humanitarian area. I understand this, and I think I need to point out that you are a diplomat. If you don't like dilemmas, you should not work in the humanitarian, or you should not be in the diplomacy either. We try to be neutral, impartial, and independent in an environment that is highly politicized. We try to act in an environment that upholds transparency in a areas where confidentiality probably has a particular value. We need to create some uh, spaces of trust. So I do, for myself, uh, make a difference between uh, confidentiality and transparency. Transparency should not say, should not mean that everyone should know everything at all times. We need to have, uh, of course, uh, be held responsible for what we do. So we, this uh, responsibility exists. We have a governance. We uh, account. We're held accountable to our donors. We are, of course, to respect the Geneva Conventions. But this does not mean that there are not areas where, for operational purposes, we don't say immediately all that we do. If I start telling you what we see by visiting uh, 1 million detainees in 100 countries of the world, tomorrow we will not, will not will be denied access to these prisons. If I tell you here and now what the uh, Red Cross meets in terms of violations of international human rights on the fronts, uh, war fronts uh, that I have talked, tomorrow will not be uh, will be denied access, and it will be. Of course, uh, something that is detrimental to the populations that we try to assist and help. So uh, there is, a, we need to strike this balance. This is something that is very delicate. Uh, but I think now uh, one of the lessons that we have learned, we have learned how to talk in very generic terms about some recurrent problems. We have a public initiative, like for example, healthcare in danger, which we launched uh, with. Uh, health professionals uh, throughout the world. And uh, it does not talk about uh, some specific characteristics, but uh, we talk about uh, trends that uh, to attack doctors now, to force them to violate their professional uh, medical ethic, 
to uh, destroy hospitals, for example, as strategic objects in war situations. This, this we don't talk every day about a specific object, but we also try to show to the international community what the general trends are and uh, around which we want to mobilize political action. This is what we have managed to do, for example, with the uh, resolution 2286 at the Security Council that has uh, taken decision on this issue without revealing necessarily the 2,500 attacks which we monitored, verified, and on which we have, for which we have names and uh, we of people who are responsible for these attacks when we presented those statistics. So I think there is, uh, again, uh, something that is uh, something very delicate and we're trying to play with all this. There's diplomacy, as you have said. There's not only the, uh, the public, there's not only the secret issue. Uh, we. Uh, we are also working on an active diplomacy that is in a confidential manner. We try to find and uh, send messages through the states who have uh, influence on actors. We know that, of course, wars uh, don't happen just like this. There are always actors behind wars. I think it's important to talk to those actors uh, and uh, also to highlight the costs that uh, we of these uh, trends to destructive uh, unlimited violence. Thank you very much. I think what you have just said is extremely important. From the philosophical point of view, I think this is a problem that is impossible to solve. Uh, that is, this balance that you are talking about, this equilibrium between uh, ethics of convictions and responsibility. We can see this from different points of view. But I think your answer was very clear to my questions. I just wanted to add one thing to uh, when I started back to uh, calm myself. Given the ambiguities of the conflicts to which we are confronted by saying that all actors should not be doing the same thing. I see our action as uh, something that is confidential. We're working in the humanitarian space with the methodology that I have just described. I see this as just one element of uh, 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 action within a community that is much broader than what I said. Uh, other actors, uh, I think, uh, do not need to work the same way we do. I can see, for example, a UN agency that has uh, the state governance, for example, cannot have the same uh, uh, interpretation of neutrality and impartiality than an actor that has no state governance, because states are requiring something else. I can very well understand that uh, that, uh, that we don't have a similar word for legal accountability. Okay, the French word redevabilité has just been mentioned, so uh, I think there's a, a time when uh, there is a penal national or international action. Uh, and there are also a time where there is an activity for uh, the, an impartial uh, agent. But they're not mutually exclusive, but complementary. We, either within the system itself or uh, with time. Uh, there is time for every, every single thing. Now, for in situations where there is extreme fragility, like the ones which we are faced with today, our action, the, our neutrality and partiality approach gives us access to certain areas, and we can thus save lives. Uh, this is very important. And in the long, short or long run, we can also uh, create some sustainability. We cannot hope for for development, uh, there's no possibility for development in fragmented societies such as the ones we see today. One last question before asking some, taking some questions from the floor. My last question, this is a good illustration of the whole issue. What can you tell to uh, an audience like ours? What is it that you're most proud of in terms of uh, achievement over the past years? The one that you are most proud of. What can you tell us about this? Uh, some action that you are most proud of. Uh, 
Yes. So what would be this? Personally, I'm very proud of the fact that my organization, especially the uh, collaborators who negotiate on the uh, war fronts, have managed to do what they have managed to do. I told you that the number of uh, our budget figures is uh, b indicates how badly the situation of the world is. But it's also uh, tell us uh, that, that we are very relevant as humanitarian actors. So we've managed to have access to spend uh, uh, the double of what you used to spend five years ago. This is also due to the capacity, our capacity to create those spaces of uh, saving lives, re help reconstruct societies, rebuild societies. And I am very proud that our colleagues working on the ground make a great record great successes on the ground and manage to uh, talk to all the actors uh, who are in conflict and uh, create a dialogue a space for dialogue this does not change in any way the fact that the impact of this violence is greater than what we can uh, greater than the good that we can do the second thing which i am uh, cry proud of and which goes with the first element that i have just mentioned is our capacity to establish links, networks, contacts, uh, influence, and to talk to actors. I'm saying one thing that I think within this region is, uh, I can tell you this in this region, because it was public in any case. It, uh, I think that one of the vectors of uh, influence with whom the Crossroad has uh, worked, that uh, we have worked with Ayatollah Sistani Najaf, who is a uh, very a major uh, sh religious Shiite, who issued a fatwa on the behavior of the uh, carriers of weapons. Uh, and of course, same thing as what the Geneva Convention says. And this is why uh, the Ayatollah is uh, uh, issuing uh, guidelines to the uh, war, the, the, the weapon carriers. Uh, he was talked about the respect of the detainees. So this, of course, has is the consequence is of a long discussion that we had with someone like uh, this uh, 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 shade clergy who has very uh, great influence on uh, weapon carriers. This as an illustration of what uh, the Red Cross does uh, over the past years to try to check all the channels of influence in order to change behavior. I like all preventive actions. This, uh, it's like uh, beliefs. I cannot prove that lives ha have been saved. However, it's important to have uh, the greatest authorities uh, speak clearly about what it is possible to do, not possible to do, what is legal, what is not legal. And I think we always manage to uh, bring some influence and to give significance to the uh, international humanitarian law.